I'm really excited about um, the emergence of sort of digital health solutions coming to healthcare, um, and that's sort of what I want to talk a, a bit about tonight. Um, before I get into the meat of the presentation, though, I want to reflect on a really common image in healthcare um, called the Vitruvian Man. And it was a, an early attempt um, by Leonardo da Vinci, actually, to um, quantify or describe humans through mathematics. And, um, and I think that we're at the verge of uh, um, returning to this idea, um, but this time with the help of a lot of really geeky gadgets and um, really uh, awesome new tools to help us um, with that. But at the core of, of this drive is this quest to better understand ourselves and to know thyself um, and, uh, and, and to really understand um, what, uh, what are the health behaviors that I'm engaging in and how that affects my health. Um, so the, what I want to go over tonight at what, tonight's talk is um, what is the quantified self? Um, a lot of techies in the room might be already familiar with the t this term. Um, it's a bit of a tech buzzword, but um, maybe you'll learn something else and the clinicians will hopefully learn something. Um, I want to go over sort of the methodology because at the core of QS is a sort of methodology behind it. And I want to talk about um, uh, why this concept is important for healthcare. Um, and I'm going to use my project, um, Footprints, um, to illustrate that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we'll start. So, the term quantified self was um, coined in Silicon Valley by two, uh, two US um, uh, editors of a tech magazine called Wired. Um, and they sort of were basically describing this trend of computing getting closer to our bodies um, from, you know, mainframe servers, desktops, laptops, to mobile computing, and now this emergence of wearables. Um, and uh, basically what this enabled was um, easier self-tracking of human behaviors. Um, and so they coined this term quantified self because um, essentially people were early adopters of this behavior were um, accumulating a lot of data about sort of um, human health behaviors. Um, and self-tracking is not really something that's that new in, in health. Um, athletes have been doing it for a long time. Uh, patients with diabetes self-track. And um, uh, clinicians recommend self-tracking for various conditions. Um, but what this tech is really allowing us to do is to make it easier and to, to track multiple things at once very easily and to look for relationships between those things. Um, and it's made easier through the really confluence of multiple technologies, um, mobile devices, wireless um, communication, um, sensors, better microprocessors that run on less power. So at the end, what is quantified self? Well, it's a lot of geeky gadgets um, that we can wear or place around us. And um, the Jawbone Up is an example of one um, which I'm wearing. And uh, it's, it basically takes um, motion data um, that's received through an accelerometer um, and then through algorithms um, processes, that, processes that into insights and communicates that to us via concepts that we'll understand like how many steps did you take um, and what is the quality of your sleep. Um, and it can be then augmented with user inputs um, such as um, what is the relationship between the last time I had my cup of coffee and my sleep quality? Um, so, uh, so a part of quantified self is about the geeky gadgets. Um, but also, what's important about the, the term quantified self is now being used to also refer to this global community that's emerged in over 100 cities um, that are sort of playing around with this idea of what can we track and how can we use it to optimize human behaviors. Um, and here in Melbourne, we host um, monthly meetups, um, but sort of by, um, once, uh, once every two weeks, they're pretty casual. And then we host uh, more formal meetups every two months. Um, and we um, base them off the common theme that all QS meetups um, are based on around the world. And so presenters come with QS-related projects whether that's a new tool that they're hacking together and playing around with, or a QS style project, which I'll discuss. But they'll basically answer sort of three questions in their presentation. Uh, what did you do? How did you do it? And what did you learn? 
And that really sort of encompasses um, the methodology behind um, QS. Um, and it's really about bringing the experimental method to the individual and running N of 1 studies. So um, under, uh, choosing a goal or finding a hypothesis and then identifying uh, variables that you can control and experiment with, and then running the experimenting, uh, experiment and, and see if uh, playing around with those variables helps or not. For example, using the example of sleep quality and, and coffee, I could look at the relationship between the last time I had a cup of coffee and my sleep quality and play around with when can I, when's the latest time I can have uh, a cup of coffee um, and, and not have a negative effect on my sleep. And um, you know, first gather some baseline data and then um, experiment with, with that and then track potentially um, uh, track variables which may influence it as well like activity levels and exercise and that sort of stuff. So really the, the core message behind QS is around um, it's different from say like a, a health fad diet where um, the message is largely this worked for me therefore it will work for you. And QS is more about here are the tools go figure it out for yourself. Um, and I think that's a really good message and a very empowering message um, for um, patients. There are um, some questions. Oh, the font's a little bit small. Sorry. Um, there are some sort of issues and questions that we discuss in the global community um, that there are no real clear answers to yet. Um, uh, how do we standardize data? So there are competitors for certain devices coming out, like um, the, the Jawbone Up. There's also the Nike Fuel Band and the Fitbit, etc. So the, when uh, we're looking at data between those devices, um, you know, there's a lot of power in that population level device. But can we compare steps between a Jawbone Up and a Nike Fuel Band or whatever? That's an important question, um, and. Uh, one that there's no really a, a good answer. What does privacy mean in the world of quantified self? So especially you know in the last couple of weeks with the Heartbleed bug um, coming out, um, what <laughs> will everything about our lives be you know mineable and accessible? Um, and do we care? Uh, is an important question that we don't have a good answer for. Um, who owns the data you produce? So a lot of times the the producers of devices want to own that data because of the power of the population level data. Um, but so the question is, do you, as the person who has produced that data, own it and can remove it from that pool? Or does the, uh, do the people who created the device own that data? Also, no great answer to that question. What's the unintended information you share with this data? So there's a really great example where um, uh, a user of a Fitbit, um, their wife, um, found out of some infidelity from their husband because of um, <laughs> their shared Fitbit data. So obviously, <laughs> so obviously they didn't want to share that information, but but the data was a uh, but the data was pretty da damning. Um, and, and I guess the the main question is: uh, Will con health consumers or patients really accept the cost benefit of this of these devices? Um, and I want to sort of sidetrack a little bit from, um, from this and kind of talk about Disney's magic bands. This is a picture of my sister. Um, she went with her family to Disneyland in December. And they just rolled out these things called uh, magic bands. And they track everything you do while you're there. So Disneyland knows where you ate your breakfast, how much you spent on your breakfast, where you are in lineups, how long you spent in lineups, um, and uh, what What's maybe a little bit creepy is both my nephew's birthday while they were there, and when they get close to a, when they got close to a mascot, the mascot would be notified that it was their birthday and uh, give them more more attention and wish them a happy birthday. But what's really interesting about Disney Magic Bands is that um, the consumers love it. Like the online reviews of this are amazing. My sister, because she knew I was into this stuff, phoned me and was like, "It was awesome." It made the experience so much better. It felt like, you know, I knew, uh, it felt like everybody knew who I was and um, we knew where the shortest lineups were and yada, yada, yada. And I think this is a really great example of, or, or what we need to think about when we're applying these ideas to healthcare is how can we make patient experiences better? How can we improve 
uh, patient outcomes. So we need to think beyond just um, how do I get that data, but how does it actually impact the end users and how can we actually delight them with a, an experience? Um, so why quantified self in healthcare? Well, I think that there's three main reasons. Um, we get better data. Um, we can empower patients with, with that data. And we can move from a system that's all about reacting to health conditions to um, a more predictive um, um, service. Um, so better data. Well, if you really think about what we do as clinicians, um, uh, a third of what we do is collect data, uh, then we interpret that data, and then we intervene or um, act in some way based on, on that data. And um, so I think QS can really streamline a, a lot of the processes of around a third of, of what we do. Um, and the data is better because we can sample more frequently. Um, we can sample in context, so in where they actually live. Um, and we can sample more consistently. So um, if the same person is doing the measurements, even if it might be a little bit off, um, there's um, benefits for that consistency. Um, empowerment. So uh, the, the, this sort of data really has the um, potential to change the relationship between clinicians and patients. And, um, I, I see a role uh, for clinicians as a much greater facilitation role where they can help patients run N of one studies about themselves, direct them to uh, variables that they should think about measuring and controlling and experimenting with and helping patients uh, interpret their data. Um, but ultimately the patient will become an expert of their own body by understanding that data. And, um, and, and the role of clinician, the clinician can begin to take a, a back seat into that facilitation role. And I'm really excited about this idea of moving from a patient pull type healthcare service to a health provider push um, type service. You know, we can start to, in the future, if we can start to combine data sets from multiple variables, we can start to think about looking at patterns and relationships between those variables and look for patterns to predict um, potential illness or sickness. Um, and this could allow us to then start to push providers, health provider services before the patient actually really needs it. Um, imagine you know, getting a call from your doctor saying you're going to get a flu in two days and then mailing you some vitamins or something. You know? that's, that's the potential that these devices could, could potentially have. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, my project, which um, for now is called Project Footprints. Um, we're sort of forming, forming a company, but uh, we haven't figured out a name for it or a product name, so I'm um, not very good at that part of stuff. Um, but even though today we're at the um, uh, children's, uh, I'm, I'm interested in elderly, elderly population, and um, and in falls um, and preventing falls. Um, especially as a physio, this is something we deal with quite frequently. So um, we've called it Project Footprints for the meantime, but um, hopefully that'll change. Um, and we're really about contextual gait analysis. So thinking about how can we um, gather, qual uh, measure quality of gait in the in their context. Um, so um, it's led, the project's led by myself, um, Wesley Lowe, um, who's an expecting father, so who couldn't be here tonight, um, is a CTO with some previous startup um, experience, and Savant is actually working remotely with us from India, who has um, really great robotics and um, AI, um, AI experience from the states as well. Um, so what we're doing is we're building a sensor for four wheelie walkie four wheelie walking frames for the elderly. Um, and the objective is really to, to build really sophisticated software and put it into very unsophisticated hardware so that we can roll it out in a very cost-effective manner. Um, but most importantly, it's about putting that data in the right hands. And um, so we want to push that data straight to physios um, that work in the aged care sector um, so that they can um, detect the subtle deterioration in gait um, before a fall actually happens, um, and then um, uh, intervene before, before a fall happens. Um, the reason why we've chosen to embed it into a, a walking frame 
is because um, the usability factor for tech in elderly people is very, very important. Um, and if you've ever seen uh, an elderly person try to plug an iPad in to charge it, it's, a, it's just a disaster. <laughs> so um, uh, there are like other solutions that are being pursued for this problem, um, but they're typically devices on shoes or um, embedded carpets. And um, those are going to be really big problems to charge and sync data. And plus, something on the shoe, um, I think the weight potentially might negatively impact the gait. Um, and then the problem with in, um, embedded flooring or sensors in embedded flooring is that we're not getting that rich contextual data. We're only getting a sample of only walking across that one, one spot. Um, the, the, the big kind of um, downside of our approach is that the person needs to be using a four wheelie frame, although we have ideas to roll out sensors into other gate aids as well. So we're using a computer vision solution. Um, we're a monocular camera, not a Microsoft Connect like Mohinder, um, to kind of um, identify um, uh, the feet in the, in the frame and then sort of using clustering and optical flow um, algorithms, extract data from, from that. Um, we're still in sort of um, development phase of that algorithm, but we're very close to start to test in a gate laboratory to compare that to gold standards of measurement. Um, and um, we have um, secured some partnering organizations, a, a physio provider, physio service provider in aged care called the PhysioCo, and then Benitas, which is a not-for-profit aged care provider, um, which it part has a track record of participating in, in these sorts of projects. Um, what I want to stress too, though, is that we're not just building a sensor. In fact, the sensor, the, the hardware is really off-the-shelf technology. What we're really interested in is the data set. And um, really, the objective of what we're trying to do is, through this device and, and potentially future devices, build the, the largest database of human gait in the world. Um, and uh, that data set could be very, very powerful for um, discharge planning from acute hospitals, for goal planning in post uh, subacute care settings, um, and um, very very useful for research as well. Um, Chris mentioned, yeah, Chris mentioned, uh, you know, um, the the ecosystem, and I've been a really big benefactor, or a bit, very, uh, I've benefited greatly from the ecosystem so far. Um, I was pushed into action on this idea um, by a three-night um, workshop that the Melbourne Accelerator Program ran at Melbourne Uni. Um, then I was nurtured by a uh, contest by, that was run by the STC uh, MedTech Scott Talent um, Program. Um, and then I've, network, I've been able to really network through these events and meet lots of great people. Um, and I, now I'm planning on applying to the, the MAP Accelerator program later this month, which the deadline is coming up. So if you're interested, you should look into it. So I just want to end with, um, you know, so what? So what can I do now about the, the coming of the quantified self? Well, I think that it's worth it to learn through experience. Um, so go out and buy some cool gadgets and, and claim that it's for research. And... Um, um, and, and learn through, through experience. Run some end of one studies on yourself and you'll learn the potential and the limitations of this approach. Then come to our QS meetups and share it. Um, and you know, if you have any feedback about the Footprints Project or think you can help, please get in touch with me.